Hello and welcome to my spare room. This is Luke from Support Act and today I am joined by Amber Rules from Sydney Addictions Recovery. Welcome Hi. Amber. Hi. Thanks for joining us again. Amber joined us a couple of weeks ago and we thought let's keep this discussion going about uh, drug and alcohol. Uh, Amber is a psychotherapist and she's the clinical director of Sydney Addictions Recovery which is a counselling clinic in Sydney. So Amber, what are we going to be talking about today? Oh uh, yes, yeah, so I thought um, talking about the the kind of link between trauma and addiction, and I think it's really important that we also differentiate between what trauma is. Um, so yeah, I guess I'd like to share more about that. Not everyone will have experienced really big, awful traumas in our, in their lives, uh, but some people will have, and obviously. Um, using drug, alcohol and other addictions to help manage that is how a lot of people cope. Yeah. But what often we don't understand and talk about a lot is um, something that's kind of called um, little t trauma. So when I say little t, I mean it's not spelt with a capital T, it's spelt with a little t. <laughs> um, so the difference between those two and um, how they're linked to addiction. All right, beautiful. So. Before we go on, I just want to uh, remind everyone who's tuning in that if this conversation brings anything up for you or if you're needing support in general, the Support Act Wellbeing Helpline is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you can call that on the free number 1-800-959-500. And there are people there who are skilled in working with those who work in the music industry. It's open to artists, uh, crew workers, people who work in the industry, whether you be a manager, uh, working for a label, a promoter, whatever it might be. Um, people are there waiting to take your call, uh, if, especially if this conversation today brings anything up for you. So, sorry, back to you, Amber. Yeah, thank you. I think that's really important to acknowledge when we talk about stuff like trauma, um, whether we've experienced it or not, sometimes can bring up kind of feelings for us. And for some of us, we might not even know what that necessarily means. But yeah, it, I will make sure that I don't talk about anything too uh, difficult and speak broadly today. But if anyone um, feels like that could be difficult, maybe just make sure you're watching this with someone who can support you, call Support Act, that kind of stuff, for sure. Great advice. So I, I think the first thing to think about when we're talking about trauma is, like I said, there's kind of this um, definition where big T, spelling it with a capital T of trauma, are things like... Um, uh, say having to go to war, um, having being assaulted, uh, having um, a really intense traumatic experience or a series of experiences. Um, there's single incident trauma, which is one thing that happens, and then there's ongoing trauma. Both of those are pretty awful, um, but ongoing trauma often is one of those things that leads us in our adult life to turn to things like drugs and alcohol to help us cope. Um, certainly single incident trauma does that too, but there's a lot more kind of research around the longer term trauma and the, the, all of the impacts that that can have on our physical and mental and social health. So the difference between the big T trauma and little t is important because I think a lot of us walk around in the world having experienced little t trauma and not actually realizing it. So little t trauma isn't big, obvious stuff. It can be something like growing up in a household where our parents just didn't quite get us and didn't quite understand our needs in a way that um, they were able to say, understand our brothers or our sisters. Or it might be being in a relationship that's not necessarily abusive, but that slowly over time kind of erodes our self-worth and self-esteem. Or um, it could be similar friendships, you know, friendships with people who don't quite get us and that after time that begins to really wear on us. Um, another little T trauma might be working in a, a kind of uh, a job or um, a context that feels meaningless or sort of you know, not necessarily abusive, but not supportive, not kind of fulfilling that kind of thing. Does that make sense? Totally, 100%. Yeah. So, we, I mean, I guess people um, process and perceive uh, traumatic events or, or even label things as traumatic events differently. I mean, for a lot of people, this whole crisis that's happened around COVID-19 and the loss of work, etc. some people would might perceive that as a traumatic experience is that correct absolutely and i think we have to be careful like 
you know, a lot of, I've heard a lot of my colleagues and I've said it as well, that we're, we're experiencing a collective trauma. So one of the kind of definitions of trauma is having an experience that we have no way out of. That's what makes an experience traumatic. If we feel kind of um, emotionally or literally backed into a corner. Mm. Um, and it's kind of like, mm, how do I explain it? You know, like not having control really, not having control over the outcome of you being in real or perceived danger. So for some people, COVID-19, if it hasn't impacted your life um, in any significant way, it might make you feel a bit wobbly and it might be an inconvenience and you might be missing your friends and family, but it doesn't feel uh, like you've got no choice and that you're in imminent danger of being homeless or not being able to feed yourself. So it's the same stimulus, but different people will respond to it different ways. Okay. And look, when people are experiencing those feelings of a traumatic event, like what are some tools that people can do in the moment? I mean, I guess there's a lot of people going right now feeling a little traumatised by all of this, but there's other people who will, who will be quite resilient because I guess it impacts on people differently. What are some ways that a person can, can process this happening, what's happening right now? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the, the flip side of kind of all of this trauma stuff is resilience. And um, the way, you know, resilience for a lot of people is something that is inbuilt. You know, it can be sort of a combination of it's genetic. So I was just born with it. It might be personality. It might be part of just the way I view the world. All of these things can impact how resilient we are or not. Um, but resilience is kind of one of those terms that it, it, it's hard to pin down what it really is in practice. So what, uh, what might work for one person may not work for another. But I think one of the main things to keep in mind at a time like this is that um, doing things like mindfulness are wonderfully helpful in meditation, wonderfully helpful if you can do it. <laughs> right. But for some people, for traumatized people, um, that's really hard to do because sitting still is really hard for traumatized people. So um, sitting still and meditating for half an hour, it might be more painful or more kind of triggering for someone who's had an experience of feeling mentally or physically backed into a corner. So doing things that help your body move out of that sort of state of, it's like a freeze state is really useful. Um, so you can do things like, yes, you can go for a walk, or, um, you can do exercise, but even something really simple like standing up for 60 seconds and vigorously shaking your body. Mm -hmm. Because what that does is help your body tell your brain that you're not in danger and helps your nervous system settle back down again. Um, there's lots of other things you can do. You can do tapping, um, which you can Google if you don't know what that is. Um, you can um, do something distracting. So one of the things I do if I start to feel overwhelmed is I've got a therapy dog that I work with who's also my firstborn son. <laughs> and um, so I will pat him and sit with him and play with him and just move my um, awareness to something else. And very often that can be useful enough. Yeah, so I guess it's just about keeping you know, conscious of your, your, your physical self and, and finding ways to exert some energy and maybe, you know, feel a little bit more in control of what's happening, yeah? Exactly, yeah, exactly. All right, so let's just, let's just like lift ourselves out of psychotherapist world for a moment, right? Yeah. So we've all gone through, you know, we talk about collective trauma. I mean, I guess it's a shitty event that we've collectively all gone through. Yeah. And, you know, people process trauma or, you know, whatnot, differently some people at this time like we've spoken about before are probably turning to substances what's the kind of what's the kind of uh, link there what do you see in your practice about how some people use drugs and alcohol around uh, trauma and what is what's some of your advice around how people can you know where, even if we call it small t trauma yeah. you know it's kind of creeping in and and so are people's uh, coping strategies which might be drugs or alcohol Absolutely, that. yeah. And I think one of the main things to say is when I first explain this concept to new clients, often they say, oh, I don't have any trauma. And then as we do the work together, we kind of realize like, oh, that's a shitty thing that happened. And that was quite hard for me. And oh, there's another shitty thing that happened to someone I care about. And that was quite hard for me. And then it's, it becomes like this cumulative kind of thing that leads us to wanting to relieve our pain. I so guess it's a scary term for some people as well. Like, totally. And that's why I think the concept of big T and little T is, is, is really important. But 
you know, we're all acknowledging that something crap has happened, but, uh, you know, it's in some way, shape or form, it, it is a trauma of some, you know, some yeah. time, I guess. And, you know, it's, it's quite a human thing to experience, right? Like human beings are, you know, as much as we like to think we're in control of our lives and everything, you know, a crisis like this really, um, without being over the top about it, brings these kind of existential conditions to mind, which is things like death and pain and suffering and all of those awful things that we don't like to think about. So what often can happen without us realising it is that we pick up coping behaviours of which addiction or, or not even addiction, but just using drugs and alcohol and gambling and whatever it might be um, as a way of managing the discomfort of feeling out of control. So um, the way that that gets, uh, unfortunately, the way that that can get worse is um, if we've had experiences in the past where we've struggled with drug or alcohol use, like too much drug or alcohol use, um, if we've got a family history of it, very often we're more vulnerable um, because of um, biological and environmental reasons. So there's all of these things that lead us to say something like COVID-19. And then for some of us, we um, increase our drug and alcohol use because it helps us settle. And for some of us, we can weather it pretty well without needing to do that. I guess the thing to keep in mind um, going back to that idea of like it's 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 a difficult thing to say that um or it's a difficult thing for some people to use the word trauma or even addiction so if we put those two words aside it, it's maybe something simple like shitty things happen in life and we lean on coping strategies and um for those of us who already use those coping strategies like drugs and alcohol that can become more dangerous and it's pretty human as well totally totally human yeah. and we don't make a direct oh sorry i cut you off <laughs> i was gonna say i mean lots of people have different views on those who you know turn to drugs or alcohol at a time like this but i guess the one thing that we should acknowledge is that you know like if, if humans generally are searching for something to make themselves feel better and for, for one person it's running 10ks and for another person it's something else absolutely yeah so i mean not everyone is just sitting on their hands watching binging Netflix series. I mean, some people have reported that they're busier than they've ever been. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. So, so, I mean, I guess like that fast paced nature, it kind of brings about, it's also the situation we're in the gallows humor of like, oh God, the gin is just flowing. I mean, for you, for you a person who's like wrapping up a hard day's work and, you know, drinking every day, I'm not um, pointing any fingers at anyone. <laughs> but, you know, like, the, the cocktail hour is becoming more of a thing in the household. I mean, what, what's something we should keep in mind, you reckon? Yeah, so, um, so I'm glad you brought that up because I think for those of us, I'll come to that in a second, <laughs> the cocktail hour thing, um, but for those of us who have experienced trauma in the past, whether it's big T or little T trauma, um, one of the things that can happen at a time of crisis is that we become more focused and more able to be um, productive, which I don't really necessarily value productivity. I think we live in a culture that values that about above all else, and I don't think that's good for our mental health. Um, but some of us might find that because we've thrived, or had to thrive in crisis before, that all of a sudden we become really good in a crisis situation. And for some trauma survivors, that's a really normal thing. What can often happen afterwards is there's a bit of a sort of crash, you know? But um, I think basically what happens is we're used to uh, having to survive in difficult circumstances, in traumatic circumstances. And so it's almost like this part of our brain that goes, right, I know what to do here, it takes over. Mm -hmm. So some people might be, you know, watching this and just thinking, no, that's not happening to me. I'm doing great. I'm thriving. I'm doing really well. And that's great for those people, but I'd also encourage you to make sure that it, it doesn't kind of go in peaks and troughs like this if you can. It's, it, it's, you know, you need to have limits around how much you do. I think, you know, last time we spoke, I talked about people saying, oh, we're going to use this time to write our next record or, you know, write our next book or read our next book or whatever it is. And that's great, but I also think we need to put a sort of a stop at the end of that. Otherwise, it can become quite manic and, you know, kind of, you know, frantic production, which we also don't want. Um, but, but back to that idea of cocktail hour, I think, again, um, 
there's a bit of novelty around working from home for a lot of us, I think. You know, I know it comes with challenges, but also it's really nice for a lot of people to just roll out of bed and only have to put like work clothes on from here up <laughs> and, you know, that kind of thing. And so that's a nice novelty. I've seen um, a couple of friends of mine who aren't drug and alcohol counsellors um, doing Zoom meetings at, you know, three o'clock with a glass of wine in their hand. And that's fine for a while maybe, but I think we just have to be careful that that doesn't become our new normal, especially since we don't know how long we're going to have to do social distancing for. Yeah, and just a reminder for those who will be heading back into the office at some point that you will not be able to have a glass of wine in the office at three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> well, again, depends who you work for, because I've certainly in the past worked in offices where we've done that. That's true. <laughs> Okay, well, Amber, thank you so much for joining us again today on Soundcheck. You're such a fantastic guest and I look forward to having you on again. Once again, I just want to remind people that the Support Act Wellbeing Helpline is there and ready for you more than ever at 1-800-959-500. If you work in the music industry as an artist, crew member, freelance musician, uh, somebody who works in the industry, whether it's label, touring, merch, Go for gold. Call the Support Act Wellbeing Helpline. It's uh, trained mental health practitioners uh, who know what it's like to work in the music industry. Uh, thanks once again, Amber. Thank you for having me. And we'll chat to you later this week on Soundcheck. Thanks. <laughs>